Hey there, Susie here. Do you want some YouTube tips so you can grow your channel to over 144,000 subscribers like Tasha from One Big Happy Life? Well, today I interviewed her in this video that's just coming up. So she gives the most amazing tips on how to grow your YouTube channel, even if you're just starting out. So if you want to help me grow my channel, I would love if you could subscribe and like and comment below and click the little bell so you get notified when I upload new videos. Again, thank you so much for watching. I'm super excited you're here. I'm Susie from Start A Mom Blog and let's get into the amazing YouTube tips from Tasha. Hi everybody, I am Susie from Start A Mom Blog and I have somebody amazingly super special today on our channel. Um, we have Tasha from One Big Happy Life. Um, she is a full-time lawyer so she has a full-time job. She has two kids, an amazing husband, and she grew her family YouTube channel from zero to 144,000 subscribers in two years, all while having a full-time job and kids. That is amazing. So I am so honored to have her on our live today to share all kinds of YouTube tips, how to get started, how to get traffic to your channel, how to create good videos. Um, and then she's going to give us all these amazing tips. So Tasha, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got started and why YouTube and all that? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Susie. I'm so excited to share all this YouTube goodness with everyone. So here is how I got started. So after three years of trying and one loss, we were finally able to conceive and birth our son Reeves in February of 2016. And at that time I was working at a law firm and the hours were reasonable, but I had a, a three hour commute. So I was barely getting home just in time to nurse him and then for us to go to bed together because we co-slept. And so I decided I wanted something closer to home. And so I switched jobs to what should have been a more laid back job, but they were really sneaky and didn't tell me that I would be traveling basically all the time. So I was gone the whole week, consecutive weeks at a time and only home on the weekend. So I was miserable. And then I had horrible bosses too. So I immediately started looking for a new job. So like, this is not going to work. And meanwhile, though, I was miserable. Every Sunday, I would just burst into tears at the thought of having to leave my baby and my family. And so Joseph's like, you gotta, something's gotta change. You gotta find a passion project, find something to do. And right at that same time, I got a hundred dollar check in the mail from YouTube. And I'm like, what is this? I know. Well, it turns out several years before, like three years before, I had cut off all of my hair because I decided to go natural. And I posted the video on YouTube because I had been inspired to take that leap and do that big chop because of YouTube videos, never realizing that it was over those years amassing views and dollars at a time until it finally hit that $100 payout threshold and YouTube sent me that check and I took it as a sign. I'm like, you know what? Well, I'll just start making YouTube videos. This is gonna be my passion project. I so love the, it. yeah, so in December, 2016, I started making YouTube videos, some were hair videos. A lot of it was documenting my job search. So there was one where I had seven interviews in one week and I'm pumping while I'm filming a video and driving to the internet, like driving not to the internet, driving to my job interview and pumping and I posted that video on the channel. And a month later, I found a new job, but I fell in love with making YouTube videos. So I just kept doing it. And so two years later, we have you know 144,000 subscribers and we make a six figure income from our business. And I still do work full time with my two kids and my partner, Joseph. That is amazing. That is that is so cool. Like I from, from that story, I just hear like the the effort that you put into it. it was a lot of work like you were pumping and driving and making a youtube video at the same time mm -hmm. but you just fell in love with doing this Absolutely. you just found this passion yeah it was so, a lot of fun mm -hmm. so um how were those first videos just kind of i know we have this list of questions we want to get into but i'm just kind of curious like how did you put yourself out there to make those first videos well, so it was really easy in that I had already made some hair videos. And so it had been, a, I had posted like one update to just kind of show how my hair was growing. So it's easy for me to throw up another update and then, um, you know, like uh, showing them how I was doing my hair. Yeah. The hardest part was it's actually kind of complicated to make a hair video to get it to be set up right. I didn't know anything about making videos. So I'm just like, well, I'll just try this and I'll see what happens. I think 
it helped that I wasn't super invested in it being perfect, right? Because I wasn't from the beginning like, this must be a six figure business and every single video has to count. And so it was really low pressure and I allowed myself, just gave myself that grace and that space to learn and for things to not be perfect. And then after that, I just started thinking about, well, what message did I want to put out in the world? What kind of content did I want to make? And I honestly, I didn't worry about niching down. And I know people say, well, you should niche down. And I think eventually you should. But when you're just starting out, you don't know what kind of content you really want to make and or what your audience really needs until you have an audience. Nice. So yeah, one of the best things I did was make videos about whatever I felt like making videos about. I love that. Love that so much because everybody just gets stuck on like, what should I blog about? What should I make my YouTube videos about? Mm -hmm. And it's more important just to start so you get those skills of actually how to make a video. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the perfect topic. Like you're not doing hair tutorials now, right? No, although people do ask for it because the even the the people who were there at the beginning a lot of them are still there they're like wow. man i remember when you first did your big top big chop and that's why i try to tell people your true fans they will pivot with you if you need to pivot if you decide this isn't the type of content i'm i'm going to make those are some of your truest fans who will stay with you when you shift so yes people do still ask me about my hair and as a matter of fact let's I'm talk gonna, about it you have something about the hair. hair so we were going to yeah. hold this until the end but i figured Tasha, let's share this now because it's just yes. so phenomenal. So please tell us what it is. Okay. So this is, can you see it? I just want to make sure. Yeah, put it right in front okay. of your face. There you this go. This is the April edition of O Magazine. So it just came out and this is me on page 54. So I am an O Magazine brand ambassador and I got to work with Nature Tint, which is an at-home hair guy, to do this professional photo shoot where they quote me about like how I'm a busy working mom. They have my at one big happy life right here so people can follow me. It's just kind of, it was just an amazing, surreal experience going to Manhattan, having a professional photo shoot with hair and wardrobe and makeup and a whole crew of photography crew and lights. It was just an amazing experience. Also because I started One Big Happy Life and making these videos. It's just incredible. Right, right. Mm -hmm. From like two years ago, you were making a video about how to do your hair and how you cut it to now being an Oprah's magazine. Yeah, it's, wow. it's just amazing. Yeah. That is <laughs> phenomenal. All right, so I am super honored to have you. Like. I am now three degrees away from Oprah and you're two degrees away. So, or one degree, however they, <laughs> um, all right. So we have a list of amazing questions that you guys asked last week about how to, um, everything YouTube. So we'll go through a couple of them and then we'll answer some live Q and a at the end. Um, so first question, just basic, how do you get started with YouTube? Um, well, so you need to start a YouTube channel, right? And which free? just about it's free and just about everyone has one. I feel like if you have a Gmail account that you have a Google account. And so all you have to do is head on over to YouTube and activate your YouTube account. So our YouTube channel, even though we now have a business that's an LLC, our login is still through my old Gmail address because that was the first video that I, I just randomly posted on my personal, you know, Gmail YouTube. So of course that's sort of the basic beginning, right? Of the technical part of starting a YouTube channel. You'll want to put up channel art and a profile picture, but it's actually incredibly simple and it takes less than five minutes to get your YouTube channel up and running. The harder part is the actual shooting of the videos and that can vary in level of complexity. Like you can, there are plenty of people who have grown their channels just making videos on their cell phones and not even editing those videos. But in terms of how I got started on YouTube, I always shot videos using a DSLR camera from the very beginning. I started with a Canon T5i. A Canon T5i shoots in 720p, which if you know, um, full HD is 1080p. Yeah. So that means that my videos were kind of blurry, kind of behind the technolo technological so you curve. you want 1080p on YouTube, right? You do, I would say you should, but having said that, I didn't do that. I started with what I had, which was 720p. And then once our channel, I saw it start gaining some traction. I did, I went ahead and invested in a better camera before our channel was making enough revenue to justify it because I believed in it. And so we got a Canon G7X. It was $700. 
it shot 1080p. And we use that for a lot of our vlogs and we've continued to upgrade our equipment since then. Okay. Awesome. So do you want to show us your setup now that we're since we're oh, sure. on this? You're not using your cell phone right now, obviously. No, but okay. I am using a like $70 webcam. It's the Logitech C920, I think. Okay. Um, but so that's what I'm using right now, but okay. I'm going to show you my setup and I'm just going to preface it by saying, this is like a real family house right here. Mm -hmm. So you guys are going to get the real deal. And let me, I just need to make this screen bigger so that I can actually see what I'm having you guys look at. So just give me one yeah. And if okay, you guys have a YouTube channel, let us know in the comments if you've started YouTubing or you're thinking about YouTubing. I'd love to kind of see if you guys are doing it. All right, what's that, Tasha? Okay, so this is my mic that I use for my lives. This is a Blue Yeti. Okay. Um, but the mic that we use for our sound normally is above me. It's right here. What is I, that called? Oh my gosh. Joseph knows. I don't remember the name of it. It's a Zoom H. H something. It looks like a movie set. H6. It's a, a Zoom H6. And before we were using the Zoom H1, which is much smaller, the reason why we have the H6 is we now have wireless mic packs. So this is a wireless mic receiver. So I'm telling you, our gear has is completely different from where from when we started. Right. So I'm gonna continue to circle around here. This is our dining room. This is our alcohol. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then we have these umbrella lights here because here are the, these are the windows in the dining room. They're behind us. Yeah. So there is no light in this room, none. So we need these lights. We have these two massive umbrella lights. And behind that, if you look behind it, it's behind it right there, yeah, that is a spotlight that's specifically for me because I have dark skin and Joseph has light skin. And if we don't light me up separately, he will be washed out or I will be too dark. That and then is here is our actual camera. We have a Sony a7 III, and then we have a um, like a, a little kind of confidence monitor on top so we can see what's going on to make sure, because this does not have a flip out screen, so we needed a screen up on top. Right, right, right. You gotta make sure that you're centered correctly. And it doesn't yeah. show the words, right? It's not a teleprompter. No, but we do have a teleprompter. We just rarely use it. And I can tell you the, the occasions in which we use it, but for our normal videos, we do not use a teleprompter. And then our second umbrella light. So we have two, we have two to three lights going at any given point in time. And then we have our mic in front of us, I mean above us, between the two of us, and then we have our camera across from us. Awesome. So yeah, I can make your screen setup. bigger. I just realized I can like make you full screen on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're full screen on mine. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's that's awesome. That's a lot of equipment. Did you start off with all that? No, I started off with just my camera. I had, like I said, I had the Canon T5i because, oh, I think this is really important. I had tried blogging yeah. and couldn't, so back like a couple years, like 2014 or so, I tried starting a blog and got no traction. I went, I wrote for nine months and nothing and yeah. I just gave up on it. And yeah. so that's why I had that T5i because I was interested in photography. I was interested in starting a blog. And so I was like a basic level when it came to photography with that camera. And I just used that camera, the onboard sound and shot my videos. It was on a tripod. We did own a tripod, Joseph's like childhood tripod that was like 20 years old with a broken handle. And that is how we started shooting videos. The next thing I got was an onboard, like a hot shoe mic that plugs into the top of the DSLR to make the sound a little bit better. And then we just started upgrading our cameras bit by bit as yeah. the money started rolling in and we started to become more confident in ourselves. Awesome. Okay, so how are you making money with your YouTube channel? Okay, so there are several, there are, I would say there are 10 basic revenue streams when it comes Ten. to online. Okay, cool. Let's go through them. <laughs> but so I have them written down. I don't know them all off the top of my head. No, it's okay. If you can get to five, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> okay. So of course there's ad revenue, right? So YouTube videos, just like with blogs, how you can put ads on your blog, YouTube videos serve ads in their blog in, in them right at the beginning, the ones that you can skip, which we as creators can make them unskippable if we want to and like force people to watch the 30 seconds. Um, there are also the little banner ads down at the bottom of videos. I don't know if you notice those. Oh yeah. And sometimes there are mid roll ads where you're in the middle of watching a video and it will go to an ad and then come back to the video. So all of those ad streams 
go into the ad revenue. Okay. So that's a nice, really passive revenue stream. And the awesome thing about YouTube, it's like it has built in SEO, right? Where your videos have this really long tail behind them and you don't have to do anything at all. So videos that I made two years ago, videos that I made six years ago are still making money today. So that's really awesome. Next, we partner with brands. So we have sponsored videos on our channel. So we've worked with Amazon, Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. Um, we have something coming up with Visit Florida where we're going to the Florida Keys for three or four Yay. days. And yeah, really exciting. And we get paid for all of those things. And so we're very, but we get so, we get so many asks and most of them we say no because we wanna make sure that they are a great fit for our audience. And they're a great fit for, you know, our brand too, because we're building a brand. It has a reputation and we definitely don't want to squander that reputation just for a little bit of money. Now yeah. we're looking at this thing kind of long term. So there's that. Um, we also do brand work for brands on their platforms. Ooh. So I do. Yeah. So I do three videos a week for the financial diet. Oh my God. And so we have a contract with them. We're paid for that. We also do a video a month for month for into it for their turbo blog. We do a video and a blog post. We get paid for that. So that's that's another income stream. Um, we also have our own courses. So we have our course YouTube made simple that is going to be relaunching in May. And so we get revenue from there. And then we have we have our blog, we have our Instagram. So we there are many different revenue sources coming in from <laughs> many different places. That is so cool. Yeah. So initially, if you're beginning now and you had to start over again, um, how do you get those contracts with the brands? I know a lot of my mommies would have that question. Do you reach out to them or do they come to you? Because you're just starting. They might not be reaching out to you. That's correct. And I would say when you're smaller, so starting out, if you're if you have less than 5000 subscribers, then you're definitely going to be reaching out to brands directly and you're probably not going to get more than product. So when I first started, I did a couple of meal prep videos and I reached out to Rubbermaid and they sent me a couple boxes of Tupperware, <laughs> the Rubbermaid Brilliance line, because I was really in love with it back then. And I only had 5,000 sub subscribers and they were happy to send it to me, you know, no questions asked, no expectations. And so you can definitely, at the very least, reach out to brands and say, hey, I would love to feature your product. Can you send me some samples? I, I also, I'm thinking about doing a giveaway for my audience. I think it would be a great fit and see what the brand says. So you can start with that. And that was, and I would say also look, reach out to brands whose stuff you actually were going to buy because yeah. that's where you get the most value because at the end of the day, product is not compensation. And if there is one thing that I want the mommies on this live to know, product is not compensation. And ultimate, your ultimate goal is to get away from product as compensation as soon as possible. The moment you have a large enough audience, which I would say is probably maybe around 10,000, you should at least be asking for $100 and at the like, very okay. least. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, because I think too many brands take advantage of people being new to the space and not really not being knowing to charge their worth. But if you think about it, imagine a brand going to a production company and saying, hey, will you do this Gerber baby food ad for baby food? Like who's working for baby food? Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, in the, they would treat them as professionals and know that there's going to be a story production team. There's going to be a sound guy. There's going to be someone taking the pictures, a light person, um, an editor. You're all of those jobs in one, in right. one. It's and a so, lot of work. Absolutely. And so you should be compensated for that. So, yeah. And then I would say above 5,000, then you can start applying to those influencer marketplaces where brands will post products that they're looking to promote. And then you can pitch those brands. So for YouTube videos, I think Famebit is only uh, 5,000 to join, I think. And then at 10,000, there's Grapevine Logic. And then once you hit 10,000, you can basically start applying to any of those influencer marketplaces like um, Massive Sway is one, um, Real Clever is another, and then seeing if they're going to accept you. Like they may say, well, you might need to be a little bit bigger, but don't be afraid to go for those same influencer marketplaces that you'll see bloggers go to because they have video posts there, like video campaigns there all the time. And so you can really stand out there. 
Okay, I love that. So yeah. now, okay, now that we know how you can start monetizing with sponsor posts, how do I get to 5,000 or 10,000 subscribers? What are your best tips to kind of grow your channel? Um, number one, just start. There are so many people just sitting on the sidelines saying, well, I don't know exactly what I want to make videos about. Like I need to decide before I even start. You don't need to decide before you start. Make videos about everything. See what lands, see what doesn't, see what you actually enjoy doing. Because think about it, whatever topic you pick, you're going to need to be willing to talk and write and make videos about this topic as long as your business exists, unless you pivot your business. So if you niche down too early and it turns out that you actually hate that topic, then you're kind of in a pickle, you know, then you can pivot, but you're in that same predicament again, where you may then choose something because you decide you need to niche down and then it's the wrong thing again. So I would rather you take the throw the spaghetti at the wall approach yeah. than to just sit there and let the spaghetti keep boiling and not, you know, not even test it to see if it's done, you know, like just get started. So that's number one. And then once you get started, you need to be consistent. Okay. Our okay. channel really do you do currently per week and how many should you do when you're just starting? Um, so I would, let's start with what you should do. You should do as many as you can consistently do. So if that's one a week, so I think you should at least do one a week. One a week is reasonable. It's kind of just like a blog. And YouTube is also is one of those places where your people show up and they want to see you. And if they haven't seen you in a while, they kind of forget about you. So once a week, at the very least. And then, but for us, we decided, I would say in March of 2017, and we were going to do at least three videos a week. Okay. And we've done, I would say, like four or five videos a week up until the end of 2018. And now we've scaled back at, because our channel, we're happy with the where our channel is and its growth. And we want to focus in on other areas of our business to build those areas up too. So we're down to three a week. Okay. But keep in mind, we also make one video a week for the financial diet right. and one video a month for Intuit. So we're still producing quite a bit of content. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So how long are these videos that you're shooting? So they can vary, um, and but typically we like to keep our videos between 10 to 15 minutes. Some people, you know, it depends on your audience. You definitely don't want your video to be any longer than it needs to be to get the point of, across, right? You don't want boring videos. You want your video to be tight. So it's better to have a shorter video than a longer, rambly, incoherent, boring video. Okay. But for us, we tend to pack in a lot of information. Like um, we just shot a video about how public service loan forgiveness works. And so we go into <laughs> the way, um, like how, what federal loans are, what a master promissory note is. And that's a lot of information, frankly, right. to pack in 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, so definitely. yeah, but we also realized we could tell, do a lot more. We could do 30 minutes on public service loan forgiveness, but people can't hang that long. So it's finding that right balance. I love that. Okay, yeah. and then YouTube thumbnails. What should you do in your thumbnail? So I think that it can vary, but your your thumbnails, you want them to be pretty. Um, we've experimented a lot with our thumbnail to see like what has the best click through rates. And you can see that in your analytics, which is another reason why you need to just make videos so that you actually have your analytics to see what's working and what's not working. But for us, we just find, we just, we do the same thumbnail every single time. We're just wearing different clothing. Joseph and I are smiling and it works really well. I think we're experimenting with doing some more lifestyle shot type oh, thumbnails. Oh, I love the one where he's holding you with the snow. Our daughter took that shot. Yeah, we were outside. Oh, yeah, uh, thank you. And so we really like that one, but those are more work. And so here's it to my, to my fellow mommies, you have kids, whether or not you're working, your life is busy and I get it, my life is busy too. And so if I had to do everything perfectly and go above and beyond on everything, I would never get as much done. And right. so for us, we had to pick and choose, well, what are we willing to do to, like, what are we willing to give up in order to make sure that we're able to actually meet our content schedule, which is to do three videos a week. And part of that was, I am not spending an hour putting together a special thumbnail for one video. 
Right. I don't have time for that. You know, I still work full time. So I think that will change too over time as you build up, uh, you know, this repository of photos that you can then recycle in different areas of your business on your blog, on Instagram, on um, YouTube, like that thumbnail that you mentioned that was originally for you for Instagram. And I'm right. like, oh, well, I'll just throw it up on YouTube and it worked yeah. out perfectly. So you can definitely get there, but I say there's nothing wrong with just having a nice picture of you with a nice background. This is where we tend to shoot our YouTube videos yeah. where you look nice. And that's probably the, the best thing that you actually look nice in your like photos. Like this is my, I don't look like this every day. <laughs> like this is definitely, I don't wear makeup on a day to day basis, but I do wear makeup on YouTube videos. And I think some people do and some people don't, but when you're getting, trying to get people to choose between your thumbnail and somebody else's thumbnail, when they see a picture of someone who looks open and friendly and excited and, you know, just like ready to talk to them, they're more likely to click on it. Or it could also be if they see a picture of a mom that's like, I'm tired, here's what's going on. They're like, mama, I get you. And they click on that. So it just kind of depends on who your target audience is. Like there are moms who will never click on the perfectly put together, perfectly made up. Like I have a toddler on my hip while I'm vacuuming thumbnail. <laughs> They'll never click on that because they're like, I can't even relate to you, okay. you know? So just know your audience. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Yeah. I had one of my friends come and do like a family lifestyle shoot. And she took about 100 and 150 pictures. And um, that's just what I use everywhere, my blog, on my social media posts. So it's nice to have that one day that I took all those pictures mm -hmm. and I can reuse them. So yeah. that's helpful. Um, so how do you manage it? You have kids, you have a full-time job. What's your schedule like actually growing a YouTube channel as well? So we manage it by bulk shooting our videos. So that means we'll schedule our shoots Typically on Saturdays and Sundays while Reeves is napping, we'll aim to shoot three to four videos during that period of time. The one exception is the financial diet videos because it's in our office, we have to worry about the sun. If the sun gets past, like once it's past noon, there are just light rays everywhere. So we have to shoot kind of nine, 10 on Saturday or Sunday to get those done. But so what that means is during the week, First of all, I have a content calendar, which Susie, you know all about content calendars. And so we have our content calendar. So during the week, we're working on the outlines for those in the spaces. So we commute uh, to the office two to three days a week. And our commute is an hour and 15 minutes on the train. So okay. yeah, so we're see. able to get some work done on the business while we're commuting. Okay. Where are you where there's trains in DC? DC, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Where are their trains? Yeah, I don't think I could survive otherwise. I don't know how people drive into work every single day, day after day. Like the, the train commute is killing me. And and frankly, like this, this will be my last year at my job. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. So I'll be switching over to the business full time next year. That's I'm really awesome. excited about that. I'm so, yeah. I'm so excited for you. Thank um you. all right. So another couple of things that I had on the list, and then we can go into live questions. Um, keywords and hashtags, what's your kind of philosophy on SEOing and YouTube? So I would say the first thing that people should keep in mind is I know that everyone's like, oh, search, 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 search. But the reality is most of your traffic will not come from search. I think maybe it used to be that way like five years ago or whatever. Whenever people started to jump on that search bandwagon, most of your traffic now will come from um the YouTube referrals, like so the YouTube referral engine. So when you're watching a YouTube video, there are videos underneath them where you can click on to say, oh, well, if you're interested in this video, you might be interested in this video. That's YouTube trying to decide what other videos you'll like because YouTube wants people to stay on the platform and watch more and more content. So it's in YouTube's best interest to constantly serve new things. Unlike Google's SEO, it's not in their best interest to constantly serve what's new. Right. They're looking for what's quote unquote best, which is yeah. not necessarily the case because you know you can game the SEO algorithm. So with YouTube constantly serving people, both with the selections underneath if you're on mobile or in the sidebar if you're on desktop, but also at the end of videos, it will autoplay other videos. Right. So you use your title and your description 
and your keywords. And to some extent, hashtags, I don't know how effective hashtags are. Sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't. I see no difference between the videos where I do use them and the videos where I don't use them. But as a best practice, you probably want to include them because you never know when the algorithm will start to prioritize hashtags and you don't want to have to go back and add hashtags when you can just add them now. Yeah. So the best, what you can do, what you're doing is really using that SEO to establish the relevancy of your video. So what other videos should YouTube be linking this video to? And so that's that's really what where it comes in handy. Okay, okay. So you're trying to show up as the related videos or the suggested videos at the end mm -hmm. of something somebody just watched. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that and helps also, the titles. Yeah, so and then also though, your titles are what also gets people to click through to your videos. They look at your thumbnail, they look at your title, they can see the first three lines of your description box. And that's how some people decide whether or not they wanna watch that video. So it's two parts and you've gotta balance the SEO part, which might be you know, something like, like how to stop overspending with the like human part you know, so you can finally feel good about your finances. Like no one's yeah. looking for, so you can finally feel good about your finances. They're like, I'm constantly overspending. So the overspending part is for SEO, but the emotion part of it is for the people. Perfect. I love that. Like you have to work on your titles and same thing in blogging as well. Yeah. Like you have to focus on the SEO a little bit, but you have to also get people to click through. If your title, um, doesn't get people to click through, they're never going to read it. So mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. title is very important. Yep, absolutely. Um, let's see one more question from the list. Um, do you batch? You said you batch video record on the weekends. Yeah. Okay. One more that I would like to know. Yeah, go ahead. No, especially because I would have to put on makeup. Like this takes like <laughs> this takes like forty minutes because I have on like concealer and this I have on fake eyelashes. Like it's wow. <laughs> Wow. Can I, I've tried those. Are they magnetic? Are they the magnetic ones? I haven't tried the magnetic ones. These are old fashioned lash glue lashes, but I, I, I'm so tempted. I might go get the fake, like the lash extensions. Yes. I've been on the fence, but so are many they people, permanent. No, they fall out, but they just look so good on everyone that I see them on. I'm like, I got to try this at least. How long do they last? Like three or four weeks. It's ridiculous. And it's like wow. $200 to get them. Oh boy. But then the refills are cheaper. So uh, we'll see. I'm still on the fence. So interesting. Well, just a little side note. I saw like magnetic eyelashes is like a trending topic. So if anybody wants to blog about that or make a YouTube video about that, magnetic eyelashes, which I might think about. Um, okay. So how do you stay like confident when you're doing videos? How do you boost yourself up that you know you're going to talk in front of an audience right now doing a live or doing a video? How do you get that confidence? Well, the fun, oh, a live, live is sort of, is a different beast. Have so you done lives on YouTube? We do. We have done lives. Absolutely. And I actually like lives better because then we're interacting with other people. It's actually a real conversation. So when we say things, we can see people's reactions right away. The hardest part, I think, for both of us is to come off as our natural and authentic selves when we're trying to deliver very specific informative content, right? Not the family vlogs, but like when I'm telling you about the changes to the 2018 tax code, how do I say it and be myself? Uh, but with, so lives are better for that. Yeah. Now the pre-recorded stuff, that's where it's difficult. And I would say that I've improved over time. Um, it's, way more of a struggle for Joseph than it is for me because he is not a public speaker and it doesn't matter to him that it's not the public, it's a camera. He's like, I still feel that same anxiety. My palms are sweaty. It's incredibly difficult. So Pete, like Joseph is a champ the way he's kind of fought through that. But I would say for me, I watch rewatch videos. I look at my facial expressions and one of the, on one of our first videos kind of together, Joseph is talking and my face looks like this which is fine. That's a neutral expression that yeah. you would, like if you were sitting there, it would be perfectly normal. But in a video, I'm like, I have RBF. Like it really, <laughs> it looked horrible. And that's when I discovered that I cannot do this, that I have to do this. A little bit of a smile. Always, like it yeah. always has to be a little bit of a smile. Otherwise I look upset or disinterested. And it's just because something about the camera, it just doesn't translate. Right. Also, I have to be way more expressive 
to come across as engaging on a video. And I will say it feels uncomfortable at first, but it's something that you just get used to over time once you do it enough. And then you will feel awkward while you do it. And then you'll watch the video and you'll go, wow, I look great. And so the next time you're like, yeah, I got this. I'm going to nail this. My eyebrow, I'm going to put on all the facial expressions for these guys. Okay, good. Because you're, you're a little bit entertaining and you're informing your audience. So you have to kind of keep their attention because there's a lot of little video, videos on YouTube on the side. There's a lot of notifications going on. So it is our jobs as bloggers and as content creators and YouTubers to keep our readers' attention. So yep, I, exactly. I love it. And I think one of the, just to piggyback on that, the worst advice that I see out there, because you know, people give people advice out in Facebook book groups and especially with videos. And they're like, oh, well, just be yourself. Your audience will find you. And I'm like, so you need to understand that it's not about you. Yeah. You're here to serve your audience. And so it's not about what you need your audience to do for you, which is to be comfortable with how you feel like presenting yourself. It's about, well, what's the best way that you can present yourself to get your audience what they need, right? And that means that means putting in a little effort to make sure that you're delivering your content in an engaging, informative, thoughtful way and not just necessarily sitting there and saying, well, I don't want to, this thing makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to do this. So I'm not going to do it. It's like, okay, but you're, I think if you, you have to understand that you're a business and you're, you're here to serve. And so is that what is serving your people the best? Love that. Love that. Right. We have to yeah. engage, have to serve. It's not about me being comfortable sitting here in my PJs, although I have my PJ pants on, but you guys can't see that. Oh my gosh, I do too. I'm just gonna look at this. Can I just show you my PJ pants? PJ pants. Oh, my PJ oh, pants. I am legit. legit wearing my PJ pants. I have I have tiger stripes on. Mine are <laughs> pink and purple. <laughs> Love it. Nobody see well now they see, but that's okay. We can let them know that we're real. But we did yeah. dress up from the waist up and we have makeup yeah. on. Absolutely. So this is very legit. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so we went through most of the questions on our list that people submitted last week. Um, we would love to take some questions from the audience now, you guys that are watching live. Super happy to have you guys here. I um, already see a um, question here from Jacqueline. So if you have a question, please type in question and then the question itself so that I can easier see them or see them easier. First one from Jacqueline, um, what do you do to get your videos out there to grow your channel? Do you actually promote them on Facebook and Pinterest as well? So I'm going to say no. Um, so I have heard word on the street is that um, Facebook and YouTube doesn't play together really well. Yes. And so your best bet if you're going to post a YouTube video on Facebook is to, especially if it's your business page versus like your personal account, is to embed it in a blog post first mm. or to put it in the comment not the main post. So those are the, the two ways that I've heard. Now, Pinterest, I have tried uh, getting like pinning directly, both pinning the video directly. So it ends up looking like a little square and creating a pin for it and pinning it. And so I would say if I was just starting out and I had zero subscribers, a couple of views from Pinterest a day is probably worth your time, especially if you already know how to do Pinterest and you already have a Pinterest account that's humming along. I think it can't hurt. But uh, people on Pinterest still expect to go through to a blog post. They're not expecting to go through to YouTube. Right, and right. so the watch time and the retention on people that come through from Pinterest, at least in terms of my analytics, is much lower. And so the value is just not there for me. So I don't bother to pin my videos directly from Pinterest. But what I will do is create a companion blog post that, and yeah. then pin that to Pinterest. It's extra work. But at the end of the day, you should have a blog regardless because that's the only space that you own. And by the way, I should say, and I tell, I've told Susie this, but I used Susie's blog by number to put up my blog when, again, because I used to have like one big happy blog and that's how we became one big happy life. And when I created that, I used start, um, blog by number to get it up and running quickly. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Tasha. You're awesome. I definitely agree with that. Have your YouTube channel um, and then create a blog post and take that Pinterest image directed to your blog post. Mm -hmm. So if they do watch your video from your blog, does that also count as a view, right? It does. Yep. Okay. And it's a, another sig signal. Now, here's the thing. 
people speculate about what YouTube, the YouTube al algorithm does and doesn't like and what looks good and doesn't look good. So I'm just going to tell you that everything I'm telling you is kind of what I've heard. And I can't say definitively one way or another how much traction it has given on my videos because there are just too many things all going on at once with every video. But I have heard in the same way that a video can benefit a blog post by increasing on page watch time for SEO purposes, yeah. for SEO purposes, that your video being linked in on multiple pages, multiple blogs also is a signal to the algorithm that it's a valuable video. And so it's more likely to be served to an audience to be watched. That so makes perfect sense. That. If yeah. I was Google and people were taking this video and taking the effort of embedding it in different blog posts, I would, as Google, think that it's more important. So mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. From another question, how do you research YouTube topics? Um, so several different ways. Um, I definitely get uh, ideas from the world around me. Like as I'm walking around, I listen to people. I listen to how I'm feeling about content that I'm consuming, um, especially because I do, I will be involved in like the personal finance sphere and see what people are talking about. And especially what I disagree with or what I feel like people are getting wrong. I definitely like to make videos about that to kind of correct those misconceptions, like which is one of the reasons why we did that public service loan forgiveness video. I look at um, what other people are doing, like to see if there is something that would be relevant to my audience that I can put my unique spin on. Um, I also look at what my audience is telling me, right? So people will email me, they'll send me DMs on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. They will obviously also post comments on YouTube. So we ask people in our videos, like, if you have any questions about this, let us know. And we'll definitely keep that in mind. And our audience will also just suggest things to us. And then too, it's what I think my audience needs to know because my brand has a message. We have a purpose and a mission that, you, that encompasses everything we do and that involves the change that we want to see and that we want to make in the world. And so our, our audience may not even realize that they need a video about how they can take proactive steps to change their life today and or a video telling them that they can change their life because they don't know what they don't know. But we want them to know that they can change their life. So that's part of our core messaging. And so we make content around that, too. Love that. You're already yeah. a couple steps ahead of your audience. So you need to know the journey that they need to go on. Yeah and pull them through to that. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, okay. Stephanie says, how do you get on the YouTube referral lineup? Or is that just in their algorithm? Oh, so the, the suggested videos. You said using yeah. the right keywords and headlines, right? Yep, it's just, it's just the algorithm. And honestly, so my first videos, they didn't have any keywords. There was barely anything in the description box. I was just like, my big, big chop on long relaxed hair. That was it in the tab. I'm like, hey guys, I just cut off my hair. I thought that you could use this video as inspiration. That was it. No hashtags, no titles. Like my thumbnail was a screen grab. I don't even know if I had a, there was no thumbnail. It was the whatever thumbnail YouTube automatically put up on there with, which I think was a picture of me like this, right, which right, turned right. out to be a perfect thumbnail, but it doesn't, I say all this to say that it doesn't take much to get picked up by the algorithm because that video got 40,000 views Wow! over the course of years, but yeah. still. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So Amber says, um, I can't figure out which to focus on YouTube or blog. So obviously I'm the blogger in this scenario and Tasha is a YouTuber. I would suggest having at least a blog. So you have a home on the internet. And then if you're super comfortable with video and you want to do a YouTube channel, go with that. What do you think, Tasha? Yeah. Um, so, definitely have a, a blog. Now, here's what I will say. I did not. So I had a website. You should definitely have a website. Um, and I just had a coming soon on there. I had my YouTube channel and I said, hey, our website is going to be coming soon. You can go on over to onebighappylife.com and sign up to be notified. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So by the time our website even went live, we already had 300 email subscribers because here's the big secret about YouTube. YouTuber, people who watch YouTube videos are willing to leave the platform. Instagram, they don't want to leave. Facebook, they'll leave, but they come right back to Facebook. They're going there for one article and not to go deep in. YouTuber, people who watch YouTubers, they want to know more about them because they get to see you and they get to know you. So right. they're happy to go over to your website for any additional resources that you have. So 
for but having said that you must have a website you must have an email list because if youtube dies tomorrow well not only does that income stream drive up die up dry up but i have no way to access those 144,000 subscribers if they didn't sign up for my email list so I you must that. have a website yeah. yeah like if you really want to do video and you're great with that then have a coming soon page on your website mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then just capture those email leads maybe just have one freebie and do your youtube videos and start growing your audience love yes. that all right. Absolutely. And here's the other thing. The reason why you should go ahead and get your website is because we were one big happy. And when I went to go buy one big happy dot com, Jim Marie owned it, oh. which means I can't have yeah. one big happy dot com. And so then we're like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? We need to rebrand. Yeah. And so then we're like, well, can we just add something on the end of one big happy? And it turned out one big happy life dot com was available and Instagram at one big happy life and Twitter at one big happy life yeah. and Facebook at one big happy life. And you want to own all of those things for your brand's name. So if you're going to create, so you want to find your website first, that's kind of the hardest part because people stay buying domain names to yeah. sit on them. So oh, yeah, I have like 20. <laughs> yeah. So make sure that you own it before you start building a brand around it with YouTube because you cannot go back and change your videos. Unlike a blog post, once your video is up, it's up. And if you take it down, then it loses its spot in the algorithm. Oh, man. You can't yeah. add like a little end video, like a 10 second video. Can you add that? No. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, you can cut a video down artificially, but you can't add anything to it. At least as far as I know, if somebody knows different, you drop yeah. a comment. But as far as I know, you cannot. That that is I, I thought yeah. like you could add an end card, but that's not what an end card is, right? Mm -mm. No, that just refers them to other sources. So you can refer them to another website or another YouTube video or one of your playlists. Mm, good to know. Good to know. Okay. How do you connect the thumbnail to the video? It's it's on the, on the back end of YouTube, like right where you upload the video. It's all on one page. So you click upload, you upload the video. And as the video is uploading, the videos kind of I don't know what to call it. Kind of like when you're doing a blog post, how in WordPress, where you have the opportunity to embed pictures and type every all of your type everything in, yeah. put in your like tags, put in your categories, do your like Yoast SEO title and um, description. It's just like that on the YouTube side, where you have a point, a place where you can put in your title, then a box for your description box. There's a place where you can select what playlists you want to add it to, and put in your keywords, and then also add the thumbnail. You can upload a custom thumbnail, or YouTube will suggest thumbnails once the video is processed. How do you create your thumbnails? What do you use? I use PicMonkey. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, love PicMonkey. Even though I, I mean, I also use I use Photoshop for my Pinterest pins, but I use PicMonkey for my um, YouTube thumbnails because they're basic. I don't do any kind of super crazy font things, so PicMonkey is plenty. Awesome, and your thumbnails look great. Thank you. Oh, I will say I do pre-edit my photos in Lightroom first before, like I'll whiten our teeth a little bit and, you know, make it look a little brighter. Cause you know, you want your thumbnails to pop yeah. and then I'll upload that to PicMonkey and do the text work. Love it. Love it. It's a great tip. Um, Joanna says, at what height and distance do you put your camera? I actually, um, I'm curious about that too. Um, so camera, so we aim for the lens to be like middle of the lens to be eye height. And right now the camera looks like it's about seven feet away, but you can't do that if the audio, if your mic is on your camera. If your yeah. mic is on your camera, then you need your camera to be closer to you. But my mic is right here. I'm touching it. My camera is still like two arms distance away with my hand stuck out right there. Okay. So we can only do that because the mic is right here. Okay. That's awesome. What's more important, um, video quality or sound quality? Okay. The sound. I have sound can be so painful, but as long as your sound is okay, right? As, as long as it's not hurting someone's ears, then I would rather you have a really good looking video because people watch videos. It's all about the visuals. And so I would, I would obviously we've spent more on our camera gear than we have on our sound gear. Like I have no problem. The zoom H one is like a hundred dollars. What and is it, it is, what is it doing? is a, it's a little, it's a sound recorder. 
So it's, it's the little brother to the one that's above me here. And so you can just put it on the table right in front of you and it will record your sound. And it's amazing. We still use it from time to time, especially when we're out and about. So you don't have to spend a lot to yeah. get really high quality sound. Our camera is, we have a Sony a7 III. I think the camera body is $2,000 wow. and the lens is like $1,500, um, which is, it's a lot. This, you know, this is our second level of camera like the we had the panasonic gh7 gh gh7 i think before this and that was i think an eight or nine hundred dollar camera so okay. we've slowly upgraded as our business revenue group so we bought that with business revenue that was yeah. like you know we had plenty of money to buy that because of the business all right so this one's a really good question it's i'm a little confused by it lisa says my daughter has around three um three thousand three hundred subscribers which is pretty awesome she has done reaction videos, which I have no idea what a reaction video is. I know what those are. <laughs> okay, cool. I, I figured you would. Yeah. And she's trying to change to other types of videos. She doesn't feel like people want that, and qu she quit making videos. Should I encourage her to do reaction videos, or does she, or what she wants and see what happens? Okay, so first of all, what is a reaction video? So a reaction video is where you watch something, and then you react to it. So uh, what's, like, like if unboxing someone was video? watching, hmm? Like unboxing videos or no? So usually, what are some of the ones that I've seen? Like reacting to scary movies or mm -hmm. reacting to childhood, uh, like your child childhood cartoons. Or some of them are, you know, watch this and try not to sing along. And it's really catchy songs. Or watch this and try not to laugh. Like okay. that kind of stuff. And if her daughter, so what I would say is if your daughter is not interested in making those types of videos, then she should not force herself to make those types of videos. Because if she builds a channel based on reaction videos, then it becomes a lot harder to pivot later and it becomes a drag. YouTube is like, it can be just like any other job. If you're doing work that you hate, you will yeah. not be able to sustain it long term. So I think the better, but having said that, her audience came to her for uh, reaction videos. So when she pivots, not everyone is going to pivot with her. That's fine. At the end of the day, it is her business. She can always find more subscribers. I mean, it's like, I hate to, it's great, right? Each person matters. Absolutely, don't get me wrong. But 3,300 in the grand scheme of the world is still very small. You can find yeah. another 3,300 people that would love to watch whatever new thing she wants to watch. If she's passionate about it, the, the right people will find her. She just has to show up consistently. And I think kind of be frank with her audience saying like, well, I really did enjoy doing these reaction videos for a, a season in my life. But here's what I'm about now. And I really hope you join me because I've really enjoyed you know, yeah. having this community with you over this past however much amount of time and invite them to come with her so that she knows, hey, I'm changing. I know you see I'm changing and I hope you come with me. And some of them will that. come. Yeah. I like that, like being open that I am changing and I am growing up and I'm mm -hmm. doing something different and not kind of just like starting to pivot and not letting anybody know. Like mm -hmm. hopefully nobody notices. <laughs> yep. No, when we started, like we let people know things were going to be changing on One Big Happy Life. Like we weren't going to be doing as many vlogs and things like that. Yeah. And we just kind of let them know. Now the overall content, the the type of stuff that we make hasn't changed that much. It's just, we're not doing as many. So you won't see as many DIYs and things like that on the channel just because we don't see that it's going to fit in our plans for the channel long-term. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Um, Lakeisha says, do you get paid by how many views or how many subscribers? I'm it's, curious too. It's views and most of your views will not come from your subscribers. So that's another insider it's not a secret. Anyone who has a YouTube channel knows this, that most of your views come from people who are not subscribed to you. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this one's good. Allison says, how much time do you spend dedicating to editing videos? Okay. So it can take us maybe 20, 25 minutes to shoot one video. And it takes me maybe 15 minutes to edit the video. Okay. Well, yeah, it doesn't take very long at all because we outline our videos in advance. So even though we mess up, because we do mess up, there are lots of, you know, um, outtakes in there. It's very easy to run through and I'm faster at it now too. And I have a powerful laptop. So if you are editing on like an older machine, your editing is going to be slow as molasses. So I have a <laughs> Dell XPS um, 15. 
That is what I recommend over a MacBook Pro, especially if you are price conscious. My Dell costs $2,000. A comp there isn't even a comparable Mac because it doesn't get as powerful as the Dell. But so the most expensive I Mac is some Macs is all for video editing and no. Okay. No, I don't because, Mac, though. So I, I will it. say it's because people normally compare cheap PCs to a Mac. If you compare apples to apples, like a $1,500 PC to a $1,500 Mac, the specs will be comparable. More and more likely, the PC will be will have better specs because with Mac, some of it you're paying for that brand name, right? Yeah. And, and that's really all it is. So I recommend a Dell XPS. The highest level Mac was, would have been $1,500 more and not as powerful. So that's my recommendation. <laughs> Love it. I have a Dell XPS as well. And then my husband bought me a gaming desktop computer that I use up mm -hmm. here. So um, yeah, yes. I have this big red box. It looks like I'm playing video games, but I'm not. <laughs> it's an HP. Joseph swears by the HP Omen series. What, what is it? And then also there is another one that Joseph has his eyes on and I can tell you really <laughs> quick. Like the guys like the tech. I'm like, John, do a good job so you can just like buy tech for my business. He's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, Joseph basically handles all of our tech. I And I like it that way because I handle our content, our branding, like our mission, like all of that woo-woo, like the emotional stuff. Mm. But then, you know, um, <laughs> and and he just, I'm like, Joseph, I here's what I need. I need, like, I want some LED panels that I can move around when I'm doing my cleaning videos instead of hauling these gigantic umbrella lights. And he's like, all right, got it. Awesome. <laughs> All right, we'll do two more questions. Um, one quick one, Heather says, how do you go about videoing recipes or making foods? Okay, so there are two ways that you can do this, right? You can just put your camera on a tripod and direct it down at the food while you're doing it. Um, I would say, well, let me go back a little bit and just say the first thing that you want to do is write out all of the steps and all of the shots that you want to take because food videography is incredibly difficult and it's a huge pain in the butt if you miss a step in the middle and you've already cooked everything. So have your shot list ready from the beginning. Smart. If you want, yeah, if you want to do overhead shots, which are very pop, um, popular, like tasty style videos, the easiest way to do that is with a C-scan, which is, I'm going to make this big again, um, which is what I, we have our, um, I'm going to turn this around, what we have our mic on right here, which is this thing. You see it? It's silver. Yeah. And so it goes up wow. and above. Do you see that? Oh, and okay. then you put your camera and on there. The camera would be, oh, this is hard. Like, what am I doing? Here we go. The camera <laughs> would be there looking straight down at the surface, where, which is you preparing your food. And I'm going to tell you right away, food videos take forever. Okay. I like it. People, oh, I've done I've done a lot of meal prep videos and they just take the only thing worse than a food video is a cleaning video because you actually have to clean and that takes hours and you have to move the camera around and then you have hours of footage to edit. But it's so that's the same thing. It's you have to cook, it takes hours to cook, and then you have hours of footage that you might need to sift through. Then you have to piece it together, do the voiceover, add some music. So it's they are far more involved than a video like this where you're just sitting down talking. Yeah. Just chatting. Yeah. All right, cool. Last question. And you can answer this pretty quick because I know you have a hard stop at four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Denise says, how about copyright issues with using music? Do you use music and where do you get it if you do? So I do use music. We have music in our intro and I bought that from Audio Jungle. Um, we have a, so first of all, when we started, YouTube has free music. So you can use the YouTube audio libraries music for free. So if you go back to our earlier videos, that's all YouTube audio library. It's, um, and it's, uh, what is that thing worth that I'm looking for? It's copyright free, right? It's Creative Commons license. So you can definitely use it to post on YouTube. Also, you can go to Soundstripe there and look for Creative Commons licenses. There are people that will post their music on there with that license so you can use it. But we actually pay for a music subscription service. We use Epidemic Sound. It's something like $30 a month. And that is where we get our music from. Awesome. All right, so thank you. This has been amazing. Tell us where people can find you, where they can learn more about you and kind of download your freebies. 
Awesome. So of course you can go to my YouTube channel, One Big Happy Life, and check out all the videos over there. But I also have a seven day YouTube quick start email course that you can sign up for to get more information on really how to produce videos within the next seven days. And so that is onebighappylife.com forward slash YouTube. Okay, let me hide this and make it the right one, YouTube. There we go. Okay, I can show it on the screen. Yeah, awesome. slash YouTube. Go there to get Tasha's amazing tips and her email course on how to grow your YouTube channel. This has been phenomenal, Tasha. I am so proud that you're in Oprah's OMAC. I know. Show us again. Like, okay, okay, okay. I'm so excited about this. It's like the most surreal feeling to yeah. open up a magazine and see your face. Okay, you're gonna buy it. a couple copies, right? I, so they sent me a couple copies already, oh. right? Go ahead and sign my own magazine. Yes, <laughs> I would even have one copy, have a couple. <laughs> I'm right, sure your people want one. Thank you so much. This was really awesome. I hope everyone found this to be incredibly helpful. And yeah, thank you so All much right. for having me. Thank you so much, Tasha. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye.